Hey everybody, welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible study of the Glendale Road Church of Christ. Uh, you might have noticed that on Wednesday evenings, I've kind of been doing very basic lessons about Christianity. A couple of weeks ago, talked about how we become a Christian, and last week talked about, you know, when we become a new member of the church, what all that entails. And so tonight, uh, I want to look at another very basic lesson that I hope you'll find some encouragement in. So uh, please feel free to share this with friends. You may have some that have questions about why do y'all do what you do when you come together? Uh, and so tonight we're going to take a look at what a New Testament assembly look like. But before I do that, I want to read to you a couple of quotes from a book that I found very helpful in researching this. The author of the book, his name is Andrew McGowan, and the title of his book is called Ancient Christian Worship. He says, much of what has come down to us was written to encourage, critique, and change what Christians were doing, not describe it. So based on that, we don't have in the New Testament a specific writing or chapter or section of scripture that says, when you come together as a church, here's what you do. So we're left to kind of use deductive and inductive reasoning to kind of read between the lines, if you will, for the lack of a better term. But he also, in his book, says no one in the ancient church could have asked about styles of worship. You know, a lot of times we see some churches will have a contemporary worship at a certain time and a traditional worship at another time. But see, in the New Testament, there was just simply worship. It wasn't contemporary. It wasn't traditional. It wasn't any other uh, kind of worship other than that the, it was the worship of God. And a lot of what the church did, they borrowed from how the synagogue assembly was ran. And because they did that, some things naturally just kind of uh, spilled over into the church assembly and the worship services of the church. Uh, whereas, you know, for us, we're we didn't live then, so we have to do some research on this. So there are three things I want to do. First of all, I want to uh, talk about the terms that are translated in our Bibles as worship in the New Testament. Now, just for clarity's sake, you may or may not know, but our Old Testament is originally written in the Hebrew language with portions of it in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in the common Greek of that time, and has been translated to English. So there are several words that are translated as worship. And worship is kind of a loaded term. And so I want to look at what those words meant in the time that the New Testament was written. Secondly, uh, I want to look at the fullest passage that deals with a worship service. It is the earliest and the fullest passage. And that's 1 Corinthians chapters 11 through 16. And I say that's the earliest because the letter to the Corinthians was written about A.D. 55. So not even just a couple of decades after Jesus ascended to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection. And then the last thing that I'll do is offer a few historical comments on early Christian worship. And so if you're ever intrigued about why does the Church of Christ do what they do, why don't they do this? You know, one of the biggest questions that I'm always asked is, why don't you guys use instruments when you, when you sing? So that's a very common question. Uh, another one is, why do you partake of the Lord's Supper or communion every Sunday, whereas other churches partake of it uh, on a different, uh, a different frequency, maybe once a month, once a quarter, once a year, things like that. So I'll probably address those along the way. So first we look at these terms translated as the first of which is proskynesis. And we see this in Acts chapter 10 verses 25 and 26. And so what happened in this passage, uh, just to give you the background, Simon Peter has gone to the Roman centurion Cornelius's house. And when Peter enters, Cornelius meets him and fell down at his feet and the Bible says worshiped him but Peter lifted him up saying stand up I too am a man. Now the word translated worshiped here is proskynesis 
And anytime that word is used in the New Testament, it has to do with our posture when we worship. Like for example, here at Glendale Road, when we pray, we often will bow our heads. That is a proskinesis, that is a posture of worship. When the scriptures are read, we stand as a congregation for the reading of God's word, just as they did in the book of Nehemiah chapter eight. Some of you may remember a time when older members used to, used to kneel to one knee during times of prayer. And of course you can do any of those. You can prostrate yourself, which is lie face flat on the ground. That is a proskinesis. That's a posture of worship. And so when Peter entered, it says Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. He was doing this very thing, proskinesis. So that's the first term. The second one is Latreia. And it's often translated as either worship or serve. And so, for example, in Luke chapter 2, verse 37, it has to do with the certain things that you do. So in Luke 2, 37, Anna the prophetess worshiped or served the Lord, how? With fasting and prayer. That's what we read in the text. And in the book of Hebrews, the, tomb, the term here is used in this particular vein, as well as referring to the worship in the temple as well as the tabernacle. So if you want to jot those passages down and look through them, it will be translated as either worship or serve, depending on the, the English translation that you have. So proskinesis has to do with your bodily posture, uh, because what we do with our body can be a way of worshiping. Um, Latreia means we serve. Those are the things we do, such as prayer and fasting, singing, scripture reading, and so forth. And the last word translated sometimes as worship or serve is liturgio. Uh, you may have heard this term before because it's often used uh, in English. It's the word liturgy. So some of the, uh, some of the churches and uh, denominations, when they have their services, they don't refer to it as services or worship. They'll refer to it as liturgy. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 23, this passage is used um, as service to describe Zechariah's priestly service in the temple. But in Philippians uh, 2, verse 17, it's translated as offering. In Hebrews 9, 21, it's translated there as worship. But Acts 13, 2 is one particular passage that's notable. I want to read that to you. I'll begin with Acts 13, 1. Now in the church, there was at Antioch uh, certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Verse 2, as they ministered, it's translated in Acts 13, 2. That's the word liturgio, liturgy. As they liturgied to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so it would be as biblical to refer to our worship services as the liturgy because the early Christians referred to liturgy and that's speaking of the whole program of what we do. Now, some people will make the statement and they'll say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Now, different folks mean different things by that. And what they mean is, you know, some of them have said by I'm spiritual and not religious, they say, I just don't see the meaning behind empty acts. But see, that's how they view it. To us, the acts of our worship, the liturgy of worship isn't empty, but is infused with meaning that God has given it. And so because we are people of faith, the things that we do, we do by faith, trusting in the Lord to please him and to bring him glory and honor. So all of these three terms, proskinesis, latreia, liturgio, are often translated as worship, serve, or minister. And, but they all re, uh, refer to a certain aspect of what the assembly would have been like. Now, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, specifically verses 17 through 18, uh, also uh, chapter 11, verse 20, chapter 14, verse 23, here's what we read. Paul says, now in giving these instructions, 
I do not praise you since you come together. Notice that. Come together, not for the better, but for the worst. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. And in verse 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, chapter 14, verse 23, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place. The particular phrase translated as come together, uh, it, it, it often indicates a worship, assembly, or gathering, uh, unless the scriptures determine otherwise. So that particular phrase, coming together, uh, Paul says in verse 18, when you come together as a church. Now church, I think is, in my personal opinion, uh, not the best translation of the word ecclesia, the Greek term. Uh, I think it would be better translated as assembly, which is how it is translated in the Greek Old Testament. And the assembly, what Israel envisioned as the assembly, was when the nation gathered in Exodus 19 around the bottom of Mount Sinai. They were assembled together. They were the church of Israel there before the very presence of God. And so that's the idea that uh, first century Jews and Christians, particularly Christians who were Jewish, uh, that's how they would have looked at that as a whole. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians chapters 11 through 16, uh, you're going to note that the things that they did, according to chapter 16 too, occurred on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Uh, the seventh day of the week in their reckoning of time was Saturday, the Sabbath. Uh, that's what Sabbath means. It it's, uh, means rest, the seventh day. So on the first day of the week, Sunday, this is when those Christians met. And we see here is exactly what they did. In chapter 11, verse 20, they partook of the Lord's Supper. And this is something that Paul speaks about at length. And so because he mentions it first, I would contend that the Lord's Supper or communion was center stage in the assembly of the church. Now, I know some people only partake of it in certain intervals, um, but the early church, the first century church, second century, and third century, there's plenty of Christian literature to attest to the fact that the the earliest Christians partook of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Now, some of the arguments against doing that is, well, it can become routine, it can lose its significance, and I understand that concern. But the reality is, I don't think that there's anything that you or I can do to cause the Lord's Supper to lose its significance, nor is there anything that you or I could do to give it more meaning, because God has already given it the meaning. The meaning of the bread is to remind us of the body of our Lord and Savior that was chastised, that was scourged, that was whipped, that was beaten, bloodied, and bruised. That body that was sacrificed for our sins. That cup, that fruit of the vine, is the blood that was shed, the blood of the new covenant. No longer do we have to have this sacrificial system because Jesus has become our perfect sacrifice. And without the shedding of blood, we read in Scripture, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so the blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. And every time a sacrifice was offered in the Old Testament, depending on the type of sacrifice, there was always a portion of it that was shared with the one who brought it to offer. And so because the body and blood of our Lord have been broken and shed for our sins, we share in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the fruit of the vine or the, the cup of wine, uh, remembering the body and the blood that was broken and shed for our sins. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that we do this, and as often as we do this, we remember the Lord. And so it is a memorial. It is an opportunity not only to memorialize the sacrifice of our Savior, but also to anticipate the second coming of our Savior, because by partaking of it, we proclaim his death and also his future coming. Now, this is the meaning that God has given to the supper, and no amount of frequency or infrequency of observing it can alter that meaning. And so you and I can't give it more meaning. We can't remove meaning from it because God has assigned the meaning to it. Now, the second thing that we see 
uh, in 1 Corinthians chapters 13 and 14 in various verses that I have listed here, you have preaching. And the preaching was done either through prophecy or through the speaking in tongues. And those are two gifts, uh, especially speaking in tongues, that we don't believe are among us anymore uh, based on the description there. And I would urge you to read this to understand more. But there was the partaking of the Lord's Supper. There was preaching. But in chapters 14, uh, chapter 14, verses 14 through 16 and verse 26, Paul mentioned prayer and singing. And whenever the, the, the ancient Jews prayed, they would sometimes chant their prayers. Maybe you've seen a, 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 a video of Jews at the Western Wall, how they're rocking back and forth, you know, and they're holding their, their book. Well, they chant their prayers, almost how we sometimes sing certain portions of Scripture. Uh, and what's, what's interesting is that singing and prayer really overlap in a, in a manner of speaking. You know, we can pray our, our, our singing and we can sing our praying. And this actually is borne out in the New Testament. When Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail in Acts 16, the Bible says in about midnight they were praying and singing hymns to God. But in the Greek text, it says praying they were singing meaning that you can pray through song or you can sing through prayer. And so that's why those are so closely intertwined. Now, when somebody says, why don't you use instruments? You know, the easy answer is because they didn't use instruments in the first century. And I'm not going to get into a big debate over the whole thing. Folks will do what they want to do. But what we seek to do is to be as close as possible to the New Testament Church of Christ. And so because prayer and singing are so closely intertwined, well, if, if you use instruments to sing, why don't you use instruments to pray as well? But you see, we see them as two separate things. And there are times in the Bible when prayer is its own thing and singing is its own thing. But Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Baptist preacher, he said this, I would just as soon pray with machinery as to sing with it. So there was an infamous Baptist pastor in London, England, who himself disdained even instruments. But even though he did, that doesn't make the case. But uh, the, the simple answer is we want to be as close to the New Testament church as we possibly can. And that's typically where I leave it. So going on from there in chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul mentions this phrase, he says, according to the scriptures, which kind of infers that scripture reading was a part of the assembly. Otherwise, why would you mention according to the scriptures? And then finally, in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, there was a monetary offering. And this was taken every first day of the week. And it was often focused on giving relief to the saints, that is Christians, who had needs. And so these are all the things that the first century church did every Sunday, and they're things that we seek to do as well. In closing, I want to read to you a little bit of an excerpt. There is a book I would encourage you to pick up. It's, it's a good church history book. Nick Needham is the author. The title of the book is 2,000 Years of Christ's Power. Uh, and particularly uh, pages 66 to 75 are, are where this next bit is coming from. He says, beginning around A.D. 101 and onward, now keep in mind the Apostle John may have still been alive by this time uh, because many people, uh, many historians suggest that the Apostle John died anywhere from A.D. 98 to A.D. 106. But Nick Needham has studied all the texts relative to early Christian assemblies, and he points out a few things that I'll point out to you. First of all, the early Christian assembly or worship lasted nearly three hours. Wow, that's an awful lot of praying and singing. And by the way, they they a lot more praying and singing than there was preaching. Preaching was a minor part of the assembly, but nearly three hours on Sunday. 
Oh, point two, the congregation stood the entire time. No complaining about the hard pews at that point. Now, he mentions as well, number three, there were no musical instruments. Songs were chanted. So even today, we sing very melodically, but then they chanted. Number four, point four that he makes is that the Lord's Supper was taken every Sunday, but it was open only to believers. So they practice what's called closed communion. They wouldn't allow non-believers to partake of the Lord's Supper. And the scripture readings consisted of Old Testament scripture, a New Testament writing, and a gospel passage that was read aloud. Six, congregants greeted one another with the holy kiss. And the holy kiss is kissing on the cheeks as people in the East typically do. And the final point that he makes is that a benediction, which is a blessing, concluded the service and with, with the typical phrase, depart in peace. And then deacons served throughout in various functions, such as serving the Lord's Supper. So now history isn't inspired, unlike scripture. Uh, and so we must remember that water is usually purest nearer to the source. However, it can also become contaminated close to the source. And so the question that I would ask is, do we do church now as they did then? And I think from what we know, we don't have three hour services. We don't stand the entire time. Uh, but as far as the things that they did, I believe they did as well. A.W. Tozer in his book, Whatever Happened to Worship says this, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. Worship has often been described as a foretaste of glory divine. And so he is making the point that if you find yourself bored or turned off by worship, evaluate, evaluate. Am I truly prepared for heaven? Because heaven is certainly a prepared place for a prepared people. If you would have any questions after this lesson, our contact information will appear. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to study with you. If you'd like to look further into New Testament Christianity, we'll be glad to help you any way that we can. Thanks for joining us.